So, uh, hi everybody, thanks for coming to the Genome Legal Seminar and Discussion. Um, today it's my pleasure to introduce Donovan Robson, who's currently a research scientist at the University of Chicago. And uh, Don and I shared an office for a few years while we were both at the University of Chicago. So I have lots of uh, fun and embarrassing stories about him, um, which I won't tell during his introduction. Um, but uh, Don got his PhD in 2009 at Hamburg and uh, has made really tremendous contributions to radio transfer and modeling of explosive outflows from novae to supernovae type 1a, core collapse supernovae, uh, as well as nuclear synthesis calculations. He's currently joint funded by Gina and the University of Chicago and the Flash Center. So, uh, Don, thanks. Thank you, Sean, uh, for the kind introduction. So, can everyone hear me if I speak like this? Yes? All right, good. So, I'll be talking about uh, constraining the explosion mechanisms or mechanism or mechanisms of type 1A supernovae. Um, so, after, uh, after showing what a supernova of type 1A uh, really is, I'll show why they are so interesting to study, and, um, <clears throat> and after that we'll come to what it takes to simulate these sources. Uh, and then I'll give a few examples of simulations that I've done with collaborators in the past, and examples of how we can use the simulations to um, improve our understanding of them. So a type 1a supernova is really a thermonuclear explosion of a white dwarf. That's this old star at the end of its life, um, and type 1a is not to be confused with type 2s or type 1b's and c's that are the core collapse supernovae. Oftentimes, this is the core collapse supernovae are what you first think about in, if you talk about a supernova. Type 1a's are these thermonuclear ones. So, um, and, uh, the white dwarf is made out of carbon and oxygen, and during the explosion, that material is processed into heavier elements and that releases a large amount of energy and all of that energy, most of that energy goes into accelerating the material out of its gravitational potential well to very high velocities and none of this explosion you actually, is actually ever seen or detected. So what we really detect is uh, a pro the product of that explosion um, that's here on the right you see these clouds that expand at high velocities there's radioactive material, nickel-56 uh, mainly, that powers, uh, the, that decays and heats up this expanding cloud to very high temperatures and starts to radiate. And uh, this is a, a, a picture, a beautiful image taken of the Tycho remnant. Uh, this is a, an old supernova that is close by uh, and that we can study in, in, uh, in high resolution. Typically what we observe from supernovae is what we call light curves and spectra. This is an example. Light curve is uh, just brightness and how it evolves over time. Uh, this, this spectra here is it flux is units of wavelength. It's a function of wavelength. So these light curves, is, this, this light curve is uh, measured in time after, in time and days after explosion. And you see that it's really dim in early phases and it gets brighter later. So a supernova is this, this star, uh, all the stars live in galaxies, and uh, this is an example of a, of a galaxy that recently showed a very nice supernova, a nearby one, uh, and this, was a, this is 2014J that was discovered by an, by an, an amateur, I think. Um, and so the fact that these stars live in a galaxy is important because, this, because during the supernova explosion, material is processed and it creates chemical elements that were, were not in uh, the star uh, before. And <clears throat> uh, during the explosion, the material that is produced is being uh, expelled. Is there a pointer? No. So the stick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll be good without stick, I think. Uh, so the, the gas is, that is uh, produced during an explosion is, is being fed back to the galaxy, and out of that gas in the galaxy, new, a new generation of stars can be formed, which are then enriched. And so this is, perhaps we can call this a cycle of life for stars, and um, this leads to uh, the chemical evolution of, of uh, galaxies. 
So another reason why supernovae of type 1a are really important is uh, that it turned out, okay, it turned out that uh, it was found out that the brightness that these sources reach is very typical. And it turns out that slight differences in the brightness from source to source can be, uh, can be calibrated away in a procedure we call normalization. So now we have a source that we know, uh, that we know the brightness of. And then we can use it to 1 over r squared law to determine, uh, to, to convert our measured flux here on Earth to a distance. Now we can also measure the speed at which that source is moving away or towards us. And uh, this, is, um, this is what uh, has, what enables study, studying the universe at large distances and the expansion of it. And in 2011, this, uh, the, these three people, Perlmutter, Schmidt, and Ries, got the Nobel Prize for using the supernovae of type 1a to study the expansion of the universe and to discover that it was actually ex accelerating uh, to everyone's surprise. So this is, uh, this, these sources, these type 1As are still really important for studying the physical properties of, of dark energy. And it's a new sort of physics that we are very eager to learn more about. And type 1As are really important for that. So it's, it's perhaps no surprise that a lot of effort has gone into uh, observing these uh, objects better and better in the past years. So here's a list of current uh, major facilities and I won't go into detail what each of these facilities are specialized at, but there's also a, a number of uh, facilities that are currently under construction and that will, will make uh, the, the data that we get from these sources much more, much higher quality and, and even than what we have now. So this picture on the right from Wikipedia shows that there is a trend to making larger telescopes, but uh, a few of the important ones is on down on the left, there's Hubble Space Telescope, the, the little black uh, open circle. And on the left, there's James Webb. It's that's significantly bigger. And, is it, and to scale, there's a human, at, a human at the, on the right. So with all these uh, great telescopes, uh, it's no surprise that we, we see more and more supernovae. And this is the number of supernovae that's detected per year. The detection rate uh, as of, and we see, and this is plotted on a logarithmic scale. So really in the past 20 years, the number of supernovae that we discover per year has increased exponentially. So the total number of supernovae that we know about is really increasing very rapidly. But we're not just... Is this the total supernovae or just the 1A? Yeah, that's a good point. So this, is, this includes pretty much all the supernovae. It's not filtered, but the majority is 1As. Well, it's perhaps more, but well, I don't. I won't just <laughs> argue on that. So um, we're not just observing more of the same. We're also observing uh, things that we didn't know about they existed before. So here on the left is a, it's an important figure that will that will come back later in the talk too, and I'll explain what it shows. Is is on the on the vertical axis there's the brightness, the horizontal axis is the the decline rate, which means how quickly does the supernova light brightness fall after reaching its peak. Um, <clears throat> so the black uh, symbols and the black line is what we call the Phillips relation. That's what the, the normal 1A set can be standardized and used as, as, uh, as standard candles. And so recently we've discovered, or we uh, have discovered all these new types of um, new classes perhaps of type 1As that are either really much brighter than normal ones, or much dimmer. We call them peculiar one age. And on the right, there's a histogram of how many, of this, how many sources are found in each of these subclasses, if you will. So this is, this is really new. We didn't know, know that this was the case uh, a couple years ago. Now, this is another example of what we, how we, what we gain from, the, from modern technology. So this is a, a result that appeared just a few days ago, perhaps. Uh, Friday or so on the archive, what people did here is, is, to, is observe a distant galaxy, not too far distant, a fairly close galaxy, uh, the same patch with a high quality telescope every night again. And, and then uh, this supernova appeared, 2015F. 
So, so then you can go back to older photographs of the same patch of sky, and what they find is that on that, that same location where the supernova appears, they measure in, in a few days before the, the supernova light curve rises, there's some sort of a rebrightening happening. And this was not, never discovered before, but this could give potential, uh, this could give important clues as to what is going on before the supernova actually explodes. So we get more supernovae, we get different types of supernovae, we get high quality, all of this is increasing exponentially. The well, quality is perhaps hard to measure, but it's, it's going up really fast. But um, all of this, this acceleration in, uh, in research in type 1a, is just, it's not all just because of bigger telescopes and better telescopes. We have simulations, and this is where my expertise lies. We have supercomputers. And so this is a supercomputer called Mira in, at Argonne National Labs in Chicagoland area. Uh, this is my friend Paul, who was a colleague at the Flash Center. Um, <clears throat> and so this, has, this machine has 160,000 cores. And to us modelers, these big supercomputers are the equivalent of what the big telescopes are for the observers. So there are a number of lines uh, uh, of parallel, parallel to job. One is, for example, that using these machines you, you requires uh, writing proposals, and it's a very competitive uh, procedure, as Sean can also <laughs> testify. Um, so, uh, but then once you get access to the machine, it's very non-trivial to make good use of it. So, it's uh, the same as with telescopes, I guess. Now let's. Uh, should see what it takes to simulate a super a type 1a supernova. So starting with the initial conditions, which, which is a white dwarf in some si sort of an environment, uh, you have to first let that white dwarf get to explode. That's, that is uh, challenging. But in, during the explosion simulation, you calculate the energy that's released by nuclear processes. But you don't calculate uh, typically a very detailed large nuclear network because it's too computationally intensive to do on the fly. So that's done as a second, uh, second step, post-processing step, if you will. So, you take the, so it takes the explosion simulation, it calculates the nuclear synthetic yields in detail, and then none of that is, is ever seen, all right, all right. So what we need is Likers and spectra. So the third stage in the simulation, uh, the third simulation stage is radiative transfer calculation. So here um, is this, let me introduce you my 3D uh, simulation pipeline. For each of these simulation steps, there is a simulation software on the right that does, uh, that does exactly this. Now let's go into each of these in a bit more detail. So first of all, Flash, it's a very well-known code. Many of you might have heard about it. It's, a, it's an open source, multi-physics, 3D, magnetohydrodynamics code. It uses adaptive mesh refinement, an Eulerian grid. It's uh, professionally maintained, it's modularized, it has bells and whistles. Uh, there are over a, hundred, over a thousand users wor worldwide, and there, there are more than a thousand publications that actually use this code for, for science and research. So the second code, Flash Torch, this is the nuclear network uh, code. This is a code that I um, developed based on the Torch network. It's a, the Torch code, it's a legacy code. It has uh, LMP or, or FFN rates. In addition, um, it's a modern implement, implementation. It can do parallel I/O, uh, parallel processing in I/O. And this, so this is for massive post-processing of explosion simulations. And this goes, by the way, uh, using what I what is written here as Lagrangian tracer particles. So those are particles that at, that are advected with the fluid during the explosion, and they're Thermodynamic histories are recorded, and for each of the particles, you get a trajectory that you can then post-process. You have to worry about the fact that this may affect the, what happened during your first stage. Uh, yes, that is true. Although the, the 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 effects are typically small, so if you calculate the energy release that you would have gotten out of the full network si simulation and compare that to the energy release out of the simplified version, then that's, it's not so, um, not so different. So, the, so while this is true, the effects are typically small. 
Now, so the third uh, code or the third, third simulation software is super new. This is a, a software I developed together with, uh, with uh, an excellent uh, first grade uh, grad student, Ryan Walliger, I mentored for a few years. And so this is based on a, on a novel method that we call hybrid transport diff diffusion Monte Carlo. And it's beyond state of the art in number of respects, like in uh, terms of efficiency, or that is speed or accuracy in the first place, um, memory requirements. It's fully 3D it has, and supports multiple geometries. So it just produces Likers and Spectra. Uh, so this is just, and this is a schematic drawing of how perhaps uh, it works internally. All right, so now that we have this whole simulation pipeline in place, this is an excellent, uh, or perhaps a good, um, a good uh, opportunity to work with people to study all the different types of models that, we, that have been suggested in the literature of how a type 1a supernova might explode. So these are few recent, uh, recent collaborations and uh, yeah, this list is growing quickly. Hi, Sean. <laughs> right. So I've been talking about explosion mechanisms or models. Uh, I've never, I have so far not really gone into detail about what those models are. So, um, so tr for, for years, when we talked about type 1As, we thought about this picture of two different scenarios that might lead to an explosion of type 1A supernova. On the left-hand side, there's this, what we call the single degenerate scenario, where the de degenerate star is a white dwarf, the bright, small thing on the right. Uh, on the right hand, there's a double degenerate scenario where there are two white dwarfs in a binary system. Um, <clears throat> and now, as oh, recently, people more and more realize that actually in both of these scenarios, there are many variants of initial conditions in each of the scenarios that could that differ very differ very significantly in how the explosion happens and what you get out of it. So instead of uh, these two pictures, we have a, a much larger range of models that uh, are currently being explored in the literature. So uh, let's start with the double degenerate. So the, these white dwarfs can either collide or they can merge, which is the merge is more gradual. Uh, and that can, can be, the stars can have helium or no helium. That makes a difference. On the single degenerate side, that white dwarf that's in play uh, can either be a very massive white dwarf. White dwarfs cannot have just any mass. There's an asymptotic limit to the amount of mass a white dwarf can have. So um, if the white dwarf gets close to that limit, it gets, uh, the densities are really sensitive, uh, are really sensitive to the total mass and, and funny things can happen. But if you're far away from that limit, the white dwarf can still explode through, through uh, what we call a double detonation mechanism. So and, and the difference between the, the three, the DDT, GCD, and field detonation is uh, perhaps in how, the, how during the explosion, the, um, the model changes into a detonation. It's not so important to, to see what is exactly different between them. Uh, so, any questions? The double degenerate uh, scenario, you mentioned about the mass Oh, it does. Yes. No, absolutely. So that's one of the challenges with the, with the double degenerates is that we have this large uh, fraction of supernovae that are typical that we call normal 1As. And so we've always, like for years, we've thought like if the observations are so typical, then there must be a mechanism that leads to those that is that gives a very typical uh, mass. And this is that's a, a challenge for the for the double degenerates because in principle it can have any mass, any mass ratio, and that absolutely leads to a, to a range of outcomes. So this is a list of, of models uh, <clears throat> from the previous page. And there, here are three, co three columns for the three simulation steps. And now let's, let me show you uh, the work that I do with collaborators uh, on the different types of models. Now here, the entries in bold with bold-faced uh, 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 fonts are, are published papers. So, where people have done the explosion, 
They've analyzed it, published. This is ready, ready to use. Uh, this is ready to uh, to use and for the second and third stages in the simulation. So the the ones that are in normal phase aren't aren't published yet. So um, adding the entries on, on on the second and the third column, there's there's a lot of open spaces. So these are the things that I currently work on with um, with the collaborators, where we use the simulation pipeline that's in place to explore all these types of models. Now let's so um, now let's see what what we can actually learn from doing the simulations because it's nice to be able to do it. But what what do we learn from it? So this is the, here are a few examples of uh, recent studies that we did. One thing we can do with simulations is we can uh, take an initial condition, an initial setup, modify the initial conditions, and see how that affects the outcome in terms of nucleosynthetic yields or Likers and spectra. So what we did here is we used uh, the explosion simulations by Kruger et al. And we varied the amount of, um, so let me back up one second. So the white dwarf is made out of carbon and oxygen, but there, there's also some, there's always some small fraction of what we call metals previously processed material from other stars that is mixed into the, to the gas. Now the amount of metals uh, obviously plays a role in the, in the neutronization uh, fraction. And so here we study what, what the metals do to the results. And here's this is the Phillips relation again, where this is again the brightness versus the decline rate. The shade, shaded area there is, is approximately where the normal 1As lie. So for this particular model, for a range of initial uh, metallicities, we find that there is uh, that there is a, a trend, or somewhat of a trend, with uh, with metallicities. Now, this is a problem because what it means is, if you want to standardize your supernova, but you did not know what the metallicity was that the supernova was born out of, you ma you make a mis you make an error in in the calibration in the calibration. So um, and therefore and that is what leads to inaccuracies in, in the use of, of stand, as a standard candle. So this is a, a, a major problem. So th these are a few uh, papers that appeared in the recent years where people try to get a handle on this. And uh, most of these studies focus on the, on the near UV flux. And so, so Lenz et al, for example, show that the near UV flux is really sensitive to the metallicity. And so this, uh, but people over the years have <laughs> come to the conclusion more and more, and that's also what we find, that uh, the near UV is, is sensitive to pretty much anything in your model. So it's really hard to take the near UV and go back and conclude what your metallicity must have been. So instead, uh, what we did in this study is, uh, what, what you see, see here is uh, spectra. Um, this is uh, on the vertical axis, the brightness as a function of wavelength at four different epochs after explosion. So at the top, uh, set, the set in there is day 10 after explosion, then there's further down day 20, 30, 40. And the near UV range is around here, like 3000. And so you see that these are all sensitive to, in the near UV to the metallicity. Um, but the problem here is the near UV is sensitive to temperatures and temperatures depend, for example, is also on the amount of nickel 56 in your source. So if you have a, a brighter supernova, temperatures are generally higher, and the near UV is really sensitive to that. So we, we identified two spectral features that seem to be uh, sensitive to the metallicity, but not so much on the temperature. So if this, uh, what this means is these two features at day 30 post-explosion have the, have, um, might be useful as spectral indicators for the progenitor metallicity. So what, what this would enable to do, if this promise holds to be true, then we could use additional, inform we could use additional information in the normalization procedure that allows us to, to uh, reduce the scatter on, on, the, on Hubble diagrams and make type 1As better, better standard candles. So uh, let's look at a different example. Oh, there's 
I have a movie for this. This is a, a double degenerate um, merger simulation. And let's see if I can fast forward this a little bit. You see the primary and secondary with masses of 1 and 1.1 solar masses. So the primary gets heated up by accreting material off the secondary. And the secondary is eventually completely disrupted and accreted onto the primary. Now, at some point, we stop the simulation, like about here. And because we think it might detonate. But the detonation you cannot model in this type of simulation is an SPH simulation. Um, <clears throat> because the resolution is not good enough and, and shocks are involved. So we really need um, a code like the flash code in order to study, to study this. So this is mapped into the flash code. By the way, this is work I cut you up at all. And um, so we, uh, so this simulation is followed for, for a longer period of time, like about a dynamical time scale or a dynamical time scale and a half. And then it turns out that this model actually detonates just by itself. There's no artificial detonation required. What happens is that the spi one of the spiral arms in the accretion disk kind of collides with the primary, and that brings in hot, low-density fuel into the cold, high-density <coughs> primary white dwarf. And, and that uh, leads to, to detonation condition. So what this shows is the, the result after the explosion is over. So this is at the, after the explosion. And um, the particles that are plotted here are the Lagrangian tracer particles that I mentioned earlier. So these are advected with the flow, and we, we know the chemical composition of each of these particles, or the nuclear synthetic yields. Um, <clears throat> white in this figure means nickel 56. Blue means intermediate mass elements, and green is unburnt material, carbon and oxygen. So what's interesting is that the uh, material initially, before the ex explosion happens, most of the material is inside, inside that disk, close to the z equals zero plane. Now this phase, material is really far from that disk, and that the reason for that redistribution is that the detonation, turns, as it turns out, uh, doesn't only explode the primary, but the detonation propagates into the disk, and it burns material at low densities. Um, <clears throat> so these contours that are shown, sorry, this is a, a color plot of the density, um, and the, or, the orangish area, orange reddish area is the white dwarf, the primary. The green and yellow and blue uh, stuff is the accretion disk. And these con contours that are shown are contours of uh, of carbon 12 fraction. So it, initially it starts out with about 0.5, and then it, the detonation makes it go down to zero, pretty much. Um, so this detonation runs into the, into the disk and processes material at, at, at the densities that the disk is at, as well as in the central star. Now, the question really is, um, a model like this, it's nice that it explodes by itself, because that's one of the challenges in the field. But even if it does, does it produce anything that we ever observe? Is it, does it produce a normal 1A or perhaps a peculiar one? Well, so it turns out the total, well, so the total mass in the system was large. So this is 0.1, uh, one solar mass and 1.1 solar mass. The total mass is large for a supernova. So what, is, what that produces is something that is really slow because the, the energy that is deposited in the center has to leak out through a large amount of mass and that takes a longer time. So we find something that is not really, doesn't look like a normal 1A, it's much too, it evolves too slowly. But it turns out there is this one particular supernova out of the thousands that we know of. There's one particular supernova that was uh, measured to be just as slow and about as bright as what we find. And this was a, this was a very difficult object to explain. So two papers that I know of that try to explain this observation uh, using other method or other supernova 1A models come up with pretty crazy uh, uh, conclusions about what the initial conditions must have been. So one of the two is it, they require more than four solar masses of, of material involved, this, which is much too, way too much. Uh, the second is, um, the second requires that the carbon oxygen white dwarf that exploded was pretty much all carbon, more than 80% carbon. That's also difficult. And this model, 
gives a very natural uh, explanation of a very exceptional uh, object. Oh yes, uh, thank you. So that's indeed that's a viewing angle effect, and that uh, is something I wanted to say a bit more about. And that is that many of the white, many of the double degenerate models that people have have published show very large viewing angle effects, which is problematic because we don't find such a big range in uh, observational <coughs> properties. So this particular model has a very small viewing angle effect compared to other models, which is. Um, which is, uh, speaks for the model. Thanks. So an, another thing that we can do with the simulation to help to dis discriminate between models is, uh, <clears throat> is this. This is based on a recent discovery by Deal et al. of this very nearby supernova that I mentioned in the second slide, or the third slide, 2014J. What, uh, this supernova is so close that uh, that this group was able to detect directly the emission lines uh, from the nuclear emission lines from uh, the nuclear decay inside this galaxy. You may you may know this, because, uh, but uh, so just be brief. So these these emission lines are exactly found, and this confirms for the first time observationally this pic this picture of how a supernova explodes, as, and that it not how it explodes, I mean, um, it confirms that the light curves are powered by nickel 5060K and cobalt 5060K. So uh, here I, I take the, the measure points that they made uh, in, in their observation and I compare it to, to one of the simulation sets uh, that I did. This is, the, this is the DDT I showed earlier. This angle averaged. Um, and what it shows is that the agreement is reasonably good. It's perhaps a bit too bright in the gamma rays but it's not bad. Now let's compare a different model. This is the, the spiral model. Uh, and again, this is, oh, by the way, this is a 3D simulation, but the largest effects are in the, in the polar viewing angles. So we see light curves for different viewing angles, uh, polar viewing angles, and it's, it's averaged over as you move the angle. So we see that the light curves from the spiral model, the spiral merger, are, are problematic. I mean, they cannot explain in any way this observation because like this early point at about a 17 or so, it's about 10 times as bright as what this model would give. This is a, a last example and this is something I kind of uh, promised to Chris uh, some time ago. And, I, and uh, so what this shows is, um, <clears throat> A plot that, uh, of a measurement that was also very recently discovered. The pink uh, point up in the, in the upper right is, uh, is a measurement of a, of a remnant where they measure emission lines from uh, manganese, iron, and, and nickel, and chromium. So a lot of iron is produced in the supernova, or nickel that decays to iron. So we measure kind of the, the radioactive the ratio of stable nickel to radioactive nickel, say. And um, so the colored points are the results of the of DDT simulations with different different progenitor metal, metallicities, initial metallicities. And uh, these are calculated using LMP rates. And that's what we usually use because it's newest and best, as far as I know, that's not so much more that I know about the rates and how, how new they are. Uh, but it, it's easy to flip the switch and calculate the rates for older, uh, for these older FFN rates. And does that actually matter? Because if it doesn't, then it's not so interesting to use supernovae for, uh, astro for nuclear astrophysics research. But if it is, then this is really important. So uh, these points, sorry that they overlap for a bit, but these points are um, the same uh, yields calculated with or are, this, are the yields calculated with the FFN rates? So at least for this particular model, uh, the rates really play a role. We can do this for other models too. All right, so I hope I was able to convince you that supernova research is, is current, but is also important, will be an, an intense field of research in the near future. Um, 
with, with my simulation pipeline, we're in good position to, to work on different explosion models and, and constrain the models that are realized and that aren't. And um, uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. On the spot. So you do, you're, now, you're now looking at uh, many different explosion scenarios. So summing up, you know, looking at looking how they are, the evidence so far, what do you think is the most promising? Or is there a paper candidate or perhaps multiple ones? Right. So I've always believed, but this is a belief question. <laughs> uh, I've always believed in the single degenerate model because it's, it's so tempting to, uh, to use that asymptotic limit as an explanation for why so many supernovae look so similar. I think Sean and I had lots of discussions at the time, and we, we both thought this, there must, this, isn't, this cannot be a coincidence. But there are serious problems with the single degenerate channel. Um, but I think at the moment, the support for the single degenerate channel is growing again after, after a long uh, recent years, perhaps the recent five years or so, people were moving <laughs> into believing that the double degenerate would be more likely. I think people are moving back now. And one of the reasons is um, that the simulations that we do have trouble reproducing observed uh, quantities. I'm sure in your first slide, it's a light curve with the second bump. Does one understand how those are true? Yes. So the, let me zoom. Right. So uh, this light curve is interesting in itself because, uh, of course, the decay is exponential. It's just an exponential decay. So why don't we see any, any uh, luminosity, strong luminosity in the first place in the early epochs? It's because it happens deep inside, and the radiation has to first diffuse out. And over time, um, uh, that, diffuse, that diffuse now heats up the material so that the opacities change. And um, there is a point... Uh, where, where the material becomes more optically transparent to, uh, to the radiation to, to grow out. But then when, as the ejecta expand more, the temperatures change and the opacities change accordingly. And so this second bump here is really an opacity effect. I don't remember those being shown in all these Phillips curves. They all rather exclude from this massive volumetric. Well, if, so this is indeed, this is a bolometric light curve, uh, and the bolometric, bolometric light curve is like across the whole wavelength spectrum. Uh, but typically people use filters to measure light curves, but in the filters you see second bumps, and depending on what filter you have, the second bump can be really strong. Like in the infrared, um, in the I-band, the second peak is about as strong as the first. If you go to even larger wavelengths, in the J HK bands, then the second peak is typically brighter than the first peak. And that is something that, that that's the wavelength effect that also comes through in the bolometric light curve. So what you see here at around day 40 is really the infrared becoming strong. So all, almost all of us have the second bump. Yes, yes. Um, you seem to show several cases off the main curve, no? but not many that were on the main curve, unless I missed it. That's correct. That so that's a good question. So it, it turns out this uh, Phillips relation plot, where I, I can try to pull up one real quick. There's, there's one up here. Uh, so it turns out um, we modelers face the difficulty of having good quality data. Because, this, because the spread around that Phillips relation is really, really narrow because there are so many high quality observations that constrain this really well. And it turns out that the simulations are quite sensitive uh, to all kinds of things so that these points are easily off the, off the main Phillips relation. And this has been uh, seen as a, as a discouraging uh, feature of the models because we can't reproduce normal 1As. Well, I'm sorry? I thought you showed some abnormal ones that we seem to be happy. 
oh, the fact that they that they seem to agree. Uh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. It could, it is. Um, I would say the models are in currently in a state where we can't claim that we can reproduce uh, the observed trends in, in in that are yeah for supernova one A. We can't. I mean, there's there there are authors that claim that they can, but they use two D models, not three not three D models, um, and it's oftentimes not so uh, transparent how reliable some of the simulation steps are. In particular, the radiation transport phase. There's uh, a lot of tricks you can play with how you treat certain lines different from other lines and stuff. We don't do that. We try to do it as physically uh, realistic as possible. And in doing so, you don't always reproduce normal 1As, but you can still study trends. And that's something that we're particularly interested in, even if the model itself is not a perfect normal uh, explosion. Can I a follow-up on that? Sure. Oh, wait. All right. That's <laughs> In the single degree models, usually the white dwarf is reading uh, hydrogen and helium rich material. So, uh, but from definition, the dry eye don't show hydrogen. So, can, can the super new answer this question? <coughs> so, the question is whether hydrogen or helium should not show up if you, yes. if you have it in the. Yes, so. Yes, absolutely. So uh, what? So one of the uh, challenges in the in the type in the single degenerate channel channel is that it's not so clear in what stage of the b binary evolution uh, the supernova occurs. Whether there should be a thick layer of hydrogen helium on the top, and you, and you should really see that. And in fact, if you would put that in in the in the explosion simulation, then you would you would definitely see it in the spectra too. So what what people the the way this is normally simulated is that you take uh, a white dwarf that would be the result of a long pro procedure in that com in the binary system, and it has reached that mass. And we don't exactly know how. We thought Novae could do it, but that's challenging too. But so we take that we take that white dwarf as a, as a single thing, and uh, we typically. S skip over all the challenges that are that we ha would have to face in order to get it to that place in the first place. I seem to remember that there were there were a long series of discussions about where the how you started the first edition. Was it central when the many things cut off? Is that now settled? And uh, no, not at all. I would say uh, say um, <clears throat> so. There are, that, that is one of the challenges with how do you explode that white dwarf in a single degenerate channel. That this white dwarf is close to center seeker limits, so the densities in center are really high, but you still have to start to fire somewhere. Now there's, but recently, um, Nonaka and, uh, and um, so the press of Max Ngali things, did this work, did a heroic effort on on modeling the pre-explosion phase, what you what sometimes call the smoldering phase or the simmering phase, where they follow the turbulent flow in the center center of a white dwarf and they and they simulate the hotspots that develop and how they are uh, how the, how shear tears the hotspots apart or how they eventually develop into something that explodes. What they find is it's really highly likely. Uh, what we've all thought forever that there's only one ignition spot. So putting in multiple ignition spots is is kind of a uh, uh, perhaps a fast forward trick to you don't know exactly how it how it starts, but eventually you get something that is burning and is large. But there are there are uh, simulations or models that uh, still give rise to a detonation even if you start out with a single bubble. The single bubble is always pretty much offset from the center. And as it burns, temperatures go up and the densities go down and the, and the bubble is pushed out to the surface. And I've shown a movie about, uh, in, a, in a previous uh, presentation that, that ash pops out on the surface, can collide at the opposite pole and still lead to a detonation. So there are things like that, to, but this is not uh, completely settled. Than one. Who wants it? Oh, um, 
Yes, so uh, collisions, uh, collisions are like head-on collisions or almost head-on collisions. Question is, how do you get that there? I, that's not something I really strongly believe in that that is realistically but, uh, happening, but people have argued that this could in, in principle happen. For example, if this, if this binary system is disturbed dynamically by a third body or whatever. And the nice thing about that is that you, 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 um, during the collision, you reach, you very easily should normally reach a detonation criteria. I want to return to Doc's actual spot. And there's a sociological question, which is, is there's, sort of a, there's a huge population that follow a well-constrained trend, and there's some outliers. And I guess the question is, in modeling, um, you point out it's hard, it's hard to model any of the systems, but we more like you think we're more likely to learn more. I mean, if you want to focus your efforts, we'd rather try to get the Phillips relation correct and say there's some outliers and I don't know what they are, but they're a small in number and they're all by definition rare and unusual events. Or is it likely that some of the ones that are way off the Phillips relation could tell us something about you know if you could reproduce them, would you in fact learn something more about the Phillips relation? Yeah, I think that second uh, that second option is is correct, and I think that's the reason why, why these have been receiving more attention now um, is that this, the normal 1As have been studied for decades and we still don't completely understand them. We, we understand the large parts of what's needed to get there, but um, it's, it would be awesome if we can get some additional hints about what's happening. And perhaps these peculiar ones can provide exactly those hints. So yes, I think, I think uh, modeling the peculiar ones are are at least as important as modeling the normal ones. It seems to me that at some point, you're going to have to decide what is normal and what is not normal, and what do you include in your sample if you really want a high precision number. It seems to me you've really got to know this well. Yes, well, I completely agree. Uh, perhaps <laughs> as a modeler or a simulator, I can, I can say this is, this is, seems really challenging to me, but I leave that to the observers. And they, they, have, they have their ways of, uh, of plowing through tons and tons of data that they get, that they get in and decide, decide upon what is useful for as a normal 1A. And that means, I guess, the criterion is, can you standardize it well? And uh, for that purpose only, they can, just, they can easily discard anything that doesn't work as they want it. And I think in the past, uh, <clears throat> when follow-up on discovered supernovae was much more manual, uh, it was often done that things that didn't look promising, they didn't put so much focus on. And the fact that we are now detecting all these things is also a result of having so many uh, uh, surveys that follow these supernovae, irrespective of whether they are good standard candles or not. But this must be difficult to, uh, to decide. I don't think we have a, a physical criterion yet. Perhaps these, uh, these spectral lines could, can help there. If, if, you can, if we can identify spectral lines that systematically discriminate one observation from another, but I don't think there is any good idea about how to do that yet. So one might say that the observers do have very rigorous criteria for their selection. Basically, any supernova that adds additional scatter to the measurement of H not gets thrown out. Whether or not, whether or not they understand, they, whether they, they don't care to understand what's going on. If it introduces additional scatter rather than reducing it, it's out. I mean, there are observers that care about figuring out what's going on, but they think trying to reduce scatter and ways of estimating W not is more subtle. Well, yeah. it's a little surprise. <laughs> I had a question related to that actually. So you showed that uh, the initial metallicity uh, introduces scatter in the brightness and the decline rate of the light curve. Um, so from the observational cosmology side, they do this completely empirically, right? They don't have any understanding of the underlying physical model. Everything is calibrated empirically. So with that scatter based on metallicity, if if they could go out and they could say that supernova has exactly this metallicity, it was you know, from a star, this metallicity. How much would that reduce the scatter? And would it be 
a reduction of order the other sources of scatter in, in H naught. I I'm not sure exactly as to how the orders, uh, how uh, the magnitudes of sources of error are relatively, but I think um, people try this, right? Yeah. They try to uh, correct for this, but it's difficult because you can not so easily, you can, you can measure the metallicity of other stars in that galaxy or of, as, of a galaxy as a whole, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if it's, oh, if it's for example, a super solar, that your supernova is also super solar. It could as well be that the supernova is particular in a way. So it's, people try this, but it's hard. Uh, and how big the effect is, I think it could be important because they, they, have, they have been able to reduce the sources of error so much that small things matter. But this uh, metallicity, it's still, I mean, it's, it's important, but it's still a small effect because if you look at, uh, at the range of metallicities used here, then this goes up to a metallicity of four times solar, which is extreme, and you, you, know, you never find that. Uh, and 0.1 times solar is also extreme, but perhaps in the early universe that could be It also sort of follows the Phillips relation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Other questions for that?